Hello everybody, this is Early Medieval Embroidery and I'm Alexandra Makin and today, yes, we're starting the embroidery of the Bayer Tapestry Recreation Project. Uh, so before we start the actual stitching, I thought I would just run through um, some of the equipment we're using while I've got most of the piece covered um, and the reference resources we'll be using as well, just so that you know um, kind of the, I suppose the academic, the scholarly background that we're working to on the project. So uh, we, as you can see, the frame is set on a pair of trestles. These are my tr old trestles. I've had them since the mid nineties when I was on the RS and apprenticeship. Uh, uh, someone on the, in our year group had a car, so we all piled in drove around to the North Circular to where the Ikea was, loaded it up with these trestles and I've been using them ever since. So um, they, yeah, they work really well. They might not all be original, new nuts and bolts and things, but they're going well. We also have evidence for um, trestles and this sort of thing from later artwork, as you can see here in the image. So we know that um, particularly later embroiderers were using trestles to set their frames up. And if we're assuming that early medieval embroiderers were using frames, particularly for big projects um, and for the silk and gold work, which I've talked about in other videos, I'll put the links to those below, um, they would need trestles to balance them on or they'll need some form of um, equipment to balance them on. These are made of wood though, so they don't survive well within the archaeological record. Uh, so that's something that needs more research. There's always more research to be done. Um, so as you can see, we're set up. We've got the um, the frame set up on the trestles. Um, I've covered the majority of it. Um, this is something I was trained to do, and I think most people are trained to do. But I was trained to, um, to cover most of my work um, when I was on the apprenticeship. You just keep this bit or the area that you're working on um, free. This protects the embroidery. Um, and you can imagine that people in the past would have been doing something like this as well, especially because um, environments were not as um, uh, clean. There would have been dust and things, fibres floating around in the air. So um, you can imagine that this is the kind of thing they would have been doing then as well. Equipment wise, um, as I talked about in an earlier episode, we're using these gorgeous, gorgeous, embroidery threads, they're wool, they're dyed using natural dyes um, and I've been using these a lot for my kits and, um, and other uh, projects linked to the bear tapestry. So these are the ones that we'll be using. They, we'll be using more colourways than this but these are the colours that um, we need for the first section. Um, scissors my faithful sheer scissors. Um, as I've said in the past, um, you find um, scissors of this shape and size in um, female burials. So this is why I use these. And then needles, I've got a couple of handmade needles um, and based on archeological finds as well. So references. Um, the main references we're going to be using are the famous David M. Wilson book, um, by a Tapestry. The imagery in here is excellent, really big and clear. Uh, obviously, we need to take into account that the colours uh, shown um, may not be 100% accurate because of the printing, um, but this is going to be our main point of reference. I'm also very lucky in the fact that um, I have access to a database that shows um, the reverse of the um, hanging. And so by looking at the reverse of the hanging, um, and I've published on this um, before, you can tell which order the stitches were worked in, whether it was an outline first or the filling, etc, etc. So I'll be referring to that um, as well. And you can see it here in the background. Um, and this will help us say, work out whether we need to do the filling first, etc, etc. And at the end of the last video, I, I, my husband actually said, well, what order are you going to be embroidering it in? And then I um, said, and it came out in the video, uh, well, I don't know, I need to think about that. And then as we were going through the editing process, I realised 
how crazy is that um, statement? Because it's so inaccurate. We do know how the embroidery was worked, the order it was worked in. Um, and that's what part of my analysis and my publications are on. So let's just say I was having a bit of a moment back then. But we know um, from the areas that I've analysed uh, the construction, the technical side of the embro uh, embroidering of the tapestry, that the majority of it was worked from left to right, so left to right. And um, they, it was when they got to the scenes and um, large areas like the, the what I call the theatre buildings where you can see the action that's happening inside, that the working order changed slightly. Um, so we will discuss that when we get to each of the motifs. One of the things um, I want to do when embroidering this is actually look at the ships. I've not looked at those motifs yet. So I'm quite interested to see how, what the working order was for those and we'll be um, using that information to create our boat, our ship on, on this piece. So obviously we're starting at the left hand side which is our lovely um, floral motif um, and that's all well and good and I would normally say let's have a look at the reverse and see what order it was worked in but you can see that it's always the way, isn't it? The majority of this um, motif here isn't original embroidery. It's been um, restored in the 19th century. So what we're going to do is work on the assumption that um, it was stitched as the majority of the um, of rest of the hanging and that's the stem stitch outlines will work first and then the laid in couch work or sometimes called bayer stitch the filling stitch was worked second and so that's how we're going to work it so just to let you know before we get started i know we will get started don't worry um i've pre-cut my lengths of wool um most of them are cut to about well about accurately to 40 centimeters because i find that um, when you're working things like stem stitch um this is a good length before the wool starts to degrade um, and, and you lose the nice texture and finish on your embroidery but i've also cut some longer lengths so this is an, an experiment within an experiment these are um a meter long these are going to be for the first layer of the um laid in couch work because some of these um, areas that are to be filled 40 centimeters you'd just be able to do one length and then you'd have to re keep restarting so I thought we'd have longer lengths and see how that works for those areas and obviously because this is an experiment and we want to be as rigorous as possible I am um, writing down both my timings and the amount of thread we've used in here um, so what will also be interesting is there's a repeat of this first motif at the end. We'll see if I've got any quicker by that point. So without further ado, let's get started. We're finally there. Okay, so here we go. We're going to do about half an hour um, today just to get into the rhythm of things and see how it goes. Um, so we're starting off with the blue. We're going to work the outlines first because that's what the evidence um, on the from the back uh, shows was the working order for m not all of the um, hanging, but for most of it. Um, so if there are any motifs on here that are worked the other way around, filling and then um, outline, obviously we'll do that. But um, as I said earlier, this area is um, heavily restored, so we'll follow the traditional traditional um, way of working. Um, so the original, the threads um, were started with a knot, uh, no little starting casting on stitches as we do today. So I'm starting with a knot and the stem stitch was worked angled top left to bottom right. So the diagonal goes that way on all the stitches. So this is what we'll be doing. I'm using a needle that's oh, been um, made using, oops, 
using um, finds from archaeological excavations to um, stitch this. The stretch is quite long, which is quite, which is interesting. So people have hypothesized that um, the embroiderers may have worked one at that side and one at this side of the hanging, because obviously the original hanging is twice as wide um, as this. Well, nearly twice as wide as this. Um, so that could have been the case, especially if they were working on large frames, because they wouldn't be very easy to turn around like this one would have been, would be. But we'll keep going. I might have to stand up at some point. So. so this is stem stitch as it was worked on the bear tapestry. Um, I know that when the Victorians started doing their um, uh, organisation, the Victorians, the 19th century um, population, really like to have everything categorised and boxed and um, so gosh that's a bit big we'll see how that looks um, so they stem stitch worked in one direction was called stem stitch and then worked in the opposite direction and they called it outline stitch um, I can't remember the different directions. I'll look them up and pop them in for you as a comment. Um, and to be honest with you, there's no evidence whatsoever, as far as I'm aware, that before the 19th um, century, that people were um, using different names for the stitch. So anyway, so we're calling this stem stitch. How's that looking? The angle is quite difficult for me to see. So we're, because we're using a stitch that goes through the fabric a lot of times, we, um, we are using the 40 centimetre length of thread rather than the metre length. Um, because as I said earlier, I'm, I've personally found that this is a good length for working um, before it start, the thread starts to bobble um, and fibres come off and it loses its, its nice quality when for working at, as a fibre, as a thread, but also when it's finished, it doesn't look as good either. Um, so why we're we using this shorter one. And if I actually, I was just literally, it's just popped into my head, could probably work out the lengths of threads that they used, or we think they may have used, on the tapestry. Hmm. I should have a think about that, see what we can come up with. Gosh, this is very difficult at this angle. Let's just move this a little bit. There we go, hopefully you can still see okay. And go around the side like this, that's better. There we go. So my thread is getting a bit twisted here. Uh, so I'm just going to help it on twist. So if this was hanging below the fabric, I would just let it dangle. But as it's not, it's above, I'm just easing it out with my fingers as you can see so this um, I do have a stitch a short um, how to stitch focus on how to work stem stitch um, so if you are interested um, the link to that will be popped in the comments section below so you can have a look. Okay, we're going round. So whilst this is exciting because we're actually starting the stitching after all that prep, um, it's also um, going to be a bit of a baseline assessment type thing really because 
we'll see how much we get done in half an hour. And you'll notice I'm not that fast at the moment. Hopefully we'll get more into the zone as we get going. So most of this um, foliage design, foliage, foliage design, um, is outlined in the blue, although there are some areas it worked in the brown as well. Um, the restoration, areas of restoration or restitching um, are worked in, um, some of them are worked in the 19th century version of these colours but some are worked in the light in the fawn the light brown bay or beige um, and I don't know if that is um, accurate if there was evidence to say to show that that's those are the colours they were, were there originally or if that was um, a choice that was made for whatever reason by the um, those restoring it. Uh, so at the moment, I'm kind of in two minds as to whether to follow those colours or to use um, more of the blue and the brown. I really don't, I'm not really not sure what to do. Um, I do know that the restorers used um, the copy that was made by Stoggard, um, who was sent over a few years earlier by the Society of Antiquaries um, to take a copy of the Bear Tapestry. This is in the 1800s. I can't remember the exact date. I'll pop it in for you when, I, when I've got a chance to look it up. And um, he, uh, they used his cartoon, um, and um, I think they may have used coloured photographs, I'm not sure, I'll have to look that up, to help them uh, put in um, stitches, colours and the design, that there's areas that were missing. So it may have been that these cartoons had more, um, showed more of the original hanging, the embroidery and the stitching and the colourways than were visible when they actually came to do the restoration. Um, and so they may have been the original colours, but I'll do a bit of investigation in the meantime and um, I'll see what we come up with. But you knew we weren't going to get this bit finished today in half an hour. Especially the way how long it keeps taking me to thread my needle, blimey. I think it's because you're all watching. I'm also one of those people that hates it when um, licking it, licking the thread. So I'm just trying to get a nice point that goes through, which isn't happening. Oh, maybe that's a bit better. No, right, I have to chop the end off. Let's see if that helps. So the reason I don't like um, licking it, and I'm not saying nobody should lick the thread, um, it's a personal choice, but I don't like it because you get all the saliva um, on the end of the thread, which can then get caught up on your needle and um, your fabric and everything. Hey, there we go, fixed. Um, that's personally why I don't do it. So 
So you never know, maybe if they did this, that for the threads on the bed tapestry, they may have left DNA. Bring it out there. Right, we'll see if we can get this thread to the end here. And then I think it's coming to end of life. Well, it's coming to the end of the thread full stop. Oh, as you'll see. Yeah, you can see that the thread is getting a bit thinner, but I think we'll just make it to the end here. And then we'll start a new one. I like to try and do a little stitch right at the end, just because in my head, it firms your line up, especially with stem stitch. So there we go. Now, um, the way they finish their threads off at the end, um, when, when of a motif or when they got to the end of the thread, they didn't do little casting off stitches. What they um, sometimes, depending on whether they were going to use the thread in another section, they would leave it hanging um, and, put, and out of the way so that they could then pick it up again and use it for the next section. But if they had finished it, they would often just bring the thread up further along the stitch area and then the, the end of the thread would be caught um, by later stitching and then they would chop this bit off. So that's what we're going to do here. Okay, next thread. And because um, we're recording, I'm not actually writing down at the moment the number of threads that I'm using, but I'm keeping count two <laughs> so far, and I'll mark them in the book uh, when I finished recording. And the same with the timings as well. I'm marking all the timings down. Not here we go. Just look at the ball. Okay, so we're gonna go start at the top here. Now what I'm gonna do is because I like things to merge in or look as if they're growing out of each other and not full stop clunk and look clunky. I'm going to start this thread here. No, in fact, I'm going to actually undo that and I'm going to start just slightly further along so that I know that my outline is covered. And then I'm going to angle the thread underneath the stitching that's already been worked. I'm not saying this is 100% how it was done on the BT, but that's what we're going with because it gives a nicer finish. And talking about uh, threads, I, in the earlier, um, oh, there's some, there we go, just pull that back to the back. There we go, I don't want to leave that fluffy end showy. Um, I talk, spoke about the fact that this uh, fabric is quite um, open and in weave structure compared to um, how the original looks today and that um, I, I wondered if it was down to the linen thread that we have available today or um, even though um, my amazing weaver Liz did source thread, the thread as close to the original as possible and she's woven the fabric as close to the original as possible. Gosh that's not looking very elegant is it um whether washing and things or whether washing it has um which we know happens a couple of times has altered it anyway so uh, liz actually watched my video thank you liz and she um she sent me an email with um her thoughts on that so i just um i will let you know what she thought about it um in I'll do another little video, catch up. <gasps> There's a squirrel sneaking through the garden. Right, so we've got to the end here. Oh, that's a bit 
Let's just add another stitch in there because that's gone. Mm. Okay, we'll leave it, it'll be alright. Not 100% happy with it, but anyway. Just put a little stitch in here just so it's um, going through the line that's going this way. So then we know that the, the ends, the end of the lines will be covered. Now, my training would say, well, now you move on to this bit here because that's very close. Um, but on the original, you what you might see on the back is that this thread goes over to here to finish this um, line on this side here. So they're not always uh, working as we would today. Uh, however, what I'm going to do is I'm going to carry on working down here and then we'll start the next thread up here and then work along like that. Um, just really for economy of thread use, which you can see when you study the back of the tapestry was um, in their minds when they were um, stitching it. You know, just looking at what's on the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, what's you can see in the photograph. Um, but because you might see that this curve here comes over, but this curve here is actually restored. So um, I'm just going to go work down there and then we'll see how that works out because this is in, in place. The, what I'm assuming is the original thread is in place down here as well. Oh. Okay. Here we go. So this needle looks quite chunky, really. But it's actually quite nice to use. Oh, it looks a bit fine. It's got a nice feel to it, um, which people who embroider, I think, will understand where I'm, what, what I mean by that. It's very difficult to describe some needles you can use and you think, well, these are, they're not right, they just don't feel right. This has got a nice feel to it. And also, and I don't know if you can hear this, but as you pull it through the fabric, it has a nice satisfying chunk as it goes through. Try again, see if you can hear it. Quite satisfying sound. <laughs> Just check the picture. Yep. The blue goes all the way down. Um, carry on. And twist that thread again. So we're doing half an hour-ish of stitching here as our kind of baseline. Um, and I know in the past people have watched um, my... All right, so sorry, I'll interrupt my own thoughts here. I'm just going to take, this is the end of our thread. So what I'm going to do is in order to know that we've caught it, I'm just going to take the needle 
through that hole and then underneath making sure I catch that thread and then it will be held in place and I'm not fussed about cutting that off just yet I'll probably cut that off in a bit um, because it's quite close to uh, to the fabric there right, right. I'm just going to check the picture to see if the thread carries on that way or if they started again here all right there's some restoration work okay so what we will do I think is we'll take the thread down here um, and we'll work this bit along here as if it's the well no I don't think we need to do no we won't we'll just carry on I'm just making things more complicated than they need to be which I don't think they would have done they would have just gone on with it this is what happens isn't it when you're not just stitching you're thinking through the processes as well there we go and because it's stem stitch you can still get and when a decent angle and then when we put the filling in the filling we can really use this stitch um, the thread in in the filling which is laid in couch work or bayer stitch at this point to really push that in to make a nice angle as well so it will be okay now what was i saying oh yeah so um i know that people who have were who have watched um stitch things in the past um have said that they really prefer it if um, i don't um speed the stitching up because they like to be able to see the process um being worked so the question is how do you want me to proceed with the embroidery um, obviously I'm going to show you each motif and discuss through how each of those are worked and my thoughts etc as I go but do you want them all the um, the videos to be like this one where I talk as I stitch or would you like some where they are what we call slow stitching where you can watch it so it will just be me stitching maybe with a bit of background music and you can stitch along as well if you want to we can have some where let me just check the picture Whoop. yeah okay we can have some where um, I do a bit where it's in normal time like this one and then we speed a little bit, we do a bit more and then we speed a little bit up. Um, so a combination of the two. Um, give me your thoughts on this. I don't want you to sit there and be bored. It's meant to be an exciting and interesting thing. So, uh, yeah, let me know your thoughts. Okay, there we go. I'm just, so all I've done is a couple of little teeny tiny stitches there, going around in a very tight um, loop uh, to make it look as if this bit here, this band is bending round the foliage and keeping it in place. I think we've got enough decent thread yeah, it should be okay. Let's see. Just start this bit. If not, we will pick it. quite nice just to have some time just to do this actually although I enjoy all my aspect all aspects of my work and I know that sounds like a teaching but it is true sometimes I, I really am in the mood for stitching but I have to focus on something else because I've got a deadline coming up or whatever so it's actually quite nice to be able to just sit and do this for a little bit. Right, 
Okay, so this is looking a bit ropey here, but I think once we get that um, maiden couch work in, that will push that back, so it'll be okay. I think we'll also finish this thread at the end of this row. So one of the reasons for me, um, considering you know how much thread I can use, utilisation, economic, uh, not just the economic value, but the economy of it, is because the production and dyeing of such threads um, in the 11th century, when we think the Bayer Tapestry was made, would have been a huge, huge undertaking. Months and months of labour, preparation time, labour, um, which would have also had um, a financial cost, although we mustn't always think of financial cost in the same way as you and I would think of it today. But there was, um, so there were all these other complicated processes involved in it. It's not just about, oh, got the threads, now start stitching. So you can see that the, particularly the, um, the early medieval work, the original work, is there's a very economical use of threads, trying to use up as much as possible, waste as little as possible on the back. I'm going to take this thread up here. Uh, no, I'm, not. I'm actually going to take this thread down here because we've got a lot of outline stitches as well as filling coming in, so that will really hold this one in place. Um, there we go. <clears throat> so that's why I keep talking about economic use of threads and, and this sort of thing, because I'm very much aware that from the evidence that we have, that um, that was pro also a priority or in the thoughts and minds of the people who uh, were making the hanging. And it stands to reason that it would have been, um, really. But it's interesting that it's not really come up in research before, but I think that shows the way um, people have focused on the hanging. Gosh, I've got loads of knots in there. <laughs> right, so we're going back up to this bit here now. And I'm going to do that thing again where I come up slightly below and then angle my thread in to get that nice um, join. Um, yeah, so sort of antiquarian interest in uh, in the embroidery was um, very much, it is a beautiful object, which is fantastic, um, especially because it's embroidery and post um, the Renaissance where embroidery had been demoted to a craft um, from a fine art. Um, although I, I know those terms weren't really in use before the Renaissance. Um, so that's great, but also they were looking at trying to cement um, British history within this new position that Britain had as an imperial economic power within the world. So there was a lot of that going on, I think, what well, we know, with research of the Bayer Tapestry at, um, at that particular point as well. And then, of course, you move on to um, people becoming interested in it, in it as, a, as a, an embroidery, as a hanging, but also is it, is it telling the truth? Um, is it accurate? Or oh, is the image accurate? There's a lot to do with um, research out there to do with are oh, the image, can we take the imagery to be 100% accurate or nearly accurate? as to how people were dressing and armour and particularly to do with battles and think, um, the way battles were fought and things like that. Um, and that's, ha that's continued over time. There's also been the, um, the questions about where it was made. That's always been very important in the story of the hanging. But then you get, oh, let me check, where should I go next? So on the pictures, this bit, the outline for this bit here is um, in that pale fawn, uh, 
which I'm not sure about when my do brown I'll have a look I'll do a bit more research before I stitch that but so we're going to pop down here um and then of course during the war particularly the second world war the Nazis were um uh trying to fit it into their own ideological outlooks and, and um uh their own myth myths um beginnings of time and all of this business as well so there's um it's been a lot of research into all of this sort of thing but not much on the technical attributes um, apart from these were the stitches that we used this is how much fabric was used um, not much on that really either um, or on other technical aspects, which is quite cool because that gives me something new and exciting to investigate. And you guys too, because you can join me on those journeys, which is really exciting. And coming from an embroidery background, I find it quite weird that nobody's looked at it from that point of view. But it's a good thing because, as I say, it gives me something new to contribute. Oh, that's a bit big. Ah yes, now I've not talked about the length of my stitches. Uh, there's no scientific method. I'm going with what I think feels right. If you want me to measure the length of them, let me know in the comments and I can do and I will let you know. Um, so those of you who embroider will understand what I'm saying now. Stitching can look and feel right or not and with stem stitch if your stitches are too long it can look what I call leggy where it doesn't create a nice thick line it starts off thick and then goes really thin and then thick again as the stitches overlap or not um, so it's all it's about really learnt, innate knowledge, how you think about embroidery, what you think looks right as well. So there's lots of stuff going on there, which is some of the stuff I really like to investigate from an academic point of view as well. And also when you're going around corners and things, if the stitches were too long, you'd get these little spiky bits where the ends of the stitches are. Whereas if they're um, a good length, you should get a nice curve. And obviously some of that can be mitigated in this instance because we're putting a filling stitch in and that will push the outline stitch a bit further out and into place. But there's not that much play in it. That's also another reason why, for example, here I'm going, I often put that smaller stitch in at the very end. It's just to help the line of the stitching. Because in this instance, if I didn't, you'll see it kind of looks as if it's fading out and off. Whereas now, hopefully, it gives it a bit of a curve, which will look better. So I'm just going to go over the top of the end of this line here. Uh, so this is doing exactly the same as when you start off a new line and you angle it underneath the previously worked um, stitching, just to give it a nice finish. 
And on the Bayer tapestry, you see mixed areas. So you see some areas that look like this, but then there are other areas where um, there are little gaps or they don't quite, or they, they meet, but they just butt up. So I think different workers on the hanging had different um, ideas and methods about things like that, which I find quite interesting actually. Because, well, they may have all been wet, taught at the same place, or they may not have done. Um, they may have been taught the same technique, or they may not, or, and if they were, they may have uh, decided that they prefer to work in a different way. Or maybe they were rushed on this piece and they just had to get it done to the best um, standard that they could. Or maybe they didn't like who had commissioned it. So they're like, I'm going to get it done, but yeah, you're not getting my best work. Like, loads of possibilities. That's why the bear tapestry keeps on giving. Let me just check what happens down here. Yeah, okay. Try and wear this. Oh, if this comes off, this will be quite satisfying. So I am angling my needle in to um, the pre-worked stitches, uh, but I'm also, because I want to make that curve more beautiful, I'm pushing it over a bit as well. Uh, and I'm going to put another one in too, because I want to make it look as if this um, stem, this forage is underneath and being held in place by this band like that hopefully that will work it's only a little thing but yeah and people will probably never notice it unless they come up to it with a microscope in a thousand years time but there we go so absolute disaster i'm so gutted i've just gone and checked the videos for the stitching um, and you will notice that at this point, there's nothing, it's cut out. Uh, so basically, um, it's my fault, I pressed the wrong button on recording. And um, I did all of this extra work. <laughs> I say all of it, it's not a lot. But um, in total, this is just over an hour's work in total. I also said some really cool things, some good things whilst um, I was stitching and I can't remember what they were. So. Um, when I have remembered, if I do, I will put them um, on, in the next video. But the, actually two things I do remember I spoke about was one, um, my lovely weaver, Liz, has been in contact um, about those questions that I posed in the last video about the fabric and whether this, despite it being woven in the same type of yarn and to the same um, uh, technical parameters, uh, the differences between it. She's answered that um, and the reason I've not told you about it yet is because I want to ask her a few more questions and then I'll give like do a short interlude update. So keep your eye out for that. Um, and the second thing was um, I was talking about what type of uh, videos you might like in the future. So um, do you, um, I know that people have said before that they like to see my stitching in real time. Do you want that? Do you want short updates? Uh, do you want to see all of it being done? Do you want um, updates where I've done chunks in between and I just show you the next step? Um, I'm going to do some slow stitching so you can watch it and um, there'll be no talking and you can stitch along doing your own things as well or a combination of these videos. Tell me what you want to see and then I can uh, work along that as well. Okay, so I'm really, really sorry about it. I'm so gutted because we were doing really well. Um, but this is an hour's work 
Uh, it's used three brown threads and three blue threads at 40 centimetres per length. Um, I did moan about the quality of the brown, um, although it's the same quality as the blue, the dyes have altered the, um, the textures a bit. So I'll moan a bit more about that later on another video. Um, but in the meantime, until next time, see you then.